My name's Andy. I am Gabriel Bryan's dad uh, and uh, one of the pastors here at Campbell. Um, for those of you who are guests with us, we, uh, we had the privilege of being able to adopt Gabriel this past week, and that became final on Wednesday. Um, we've, he's been with us since, since he was born, and so from his perspective, well, he doesn't really understand what the big deal is, to tell you the truth, uh, as a two-year-old, but, um, but we sure do. During this time of Advent, we have looked at the story as Luke has told it, and, uh, and tried to see the story of Christ's birth through the eyes of the characters in Luke's story. And so today's shared experience is the experience of Mary and Joseph. I'll pick up the story in verse 26 of the first chapter. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. Moving now to chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've been wrestling with an ethical question, a moral question this week, and I need your help sorting it out. Am I wrong when somebody comes over for a visit to our house and I say to them, make yourself at home, and then they don't go and clean the kitchen? (laughs) Home. What is home? What do we mean when we say home? Several years ago, this was in the time B.C., before children, Aaron and I were visiting my parents' house on a Christmas season. We were there in the living room watching television. My parents had gone somewhere else. And the front door opened. And in walked a woman that we had never, ever seen before. She didn't see us sitting there watching TV. She walked into the kitchen, straight over to the refrigerator, and helped herself to a glass of orange juice. It was in mid-drink when she noticed us looking at her. And I said, hello. (laughs) And she kind of startled. Turns out she's one of my parents' best friends. And uh, just when she's walking in the neighborhood and needs a bit of refreshment, she feels comfortable enough to come into their home and, and have some. 
And from that moment on, Marla Imicus and we have just joked about how <laughs> being at home with someone means you can walk into their kitchen and help yourself to a glass of orange juice. Home isn't tied so much to a location. It seems it's tied to this feeling of, of comfort, a feeling of security. You know how it goes, right? You, you, you say, I'm going home. When, when you're at work, you say, I'm going home. When I'm here at the church and I, I'm doing work, I say, I'm going home. I mean, I'm going back to the place where I currently reside. 515 East MacArthur Drive. I'm going to be there in my house. That's what home is in that setting. But we don't always mean the place where we currently reside. Some of us, when we say we're going home, means we're going back to a, a family home, to a town where we lived when we were born, to the place where our parents still live, or to the old family farm or something like that. Going home can mean different things at different times to different people. Even when I'm uh, at a, an event of some kind, if I'm, if I'm at a meeting and I ha I've had to travel for this meeting, I'll be in the meeting and say, I need to go home for a little bit, meaning I need to just go back to the hotel room for a little while and gather my thoughts. So that can be home. It's not a location so much as, as a feeling. A feeling of security, a feeling of, of safety. It's the feeling that you are known that you are loved, a feeling that you are accepted for who you are. It might not be a feeling of getting along with everybody all the time. It might not be a feeling of agreeing with everybody all the time, far from it. But even in those disagreements, even in those tense moments, you're known, people know you, and your identity is affirmed because you are home colleague of ours named Chuck Bomar spoke at annual conference a few years ago. His church has a unique program. It's a mentoring program where new people to the congregation are partnered up with longtime members and they are, they are mentors uh, for those new folks. There's no agenda. There's no uh, curriculum. They just are charged to um, grow their relationship so that the new family can get connected within the congregation. And so Chuck was asked, that sounds like a great program, but how do you measure success? Good Lord, we're always about measuring stuff. How do you measure that program's success? And Chuck said, it's easy. We have a very simple measurement tool for the success of one of those relationships. As soon as the one being mentored knows where everything in the mentor's kitchen is, then we know they have developed that relationship enough. How many people do you know where they keep their coffee cups? You're thinking right now, you're making your list. Gosh, how many people do I? How many people in your life know where you keep your coffee cups? How deep are we allowing our relationships to become? How deep do we allow that sense of home, that sense of belonging, to spread from us, to be shared with others. Amen. <laughs> Mary and Joseph, in today's part of the story, found themselves a long way from home, a long way from what was familiar to them, a long way from Nazareth, where they were known, where their identity was rooted. They were at least 80 miles away, and it had taken them a while to get there. Between Nazareth and Bethlehem is not the most friendly of terrain. And if you visit Israel today and drive that on a bus, you can get there in a few hours. But to walk and ride a donkey takes several days. And when you're concerned about your health because you're just about to have a baby, you go even slower, and it takes even longer. Far, far from home. And not a trip that they chose to take. They were forced to go. They had to go to Bethlehem because of this census. Now, Luke plays a little loose and fast with the actual facts of things. History gets a little wibbly-wobbly in Luke's version of the story. You see, Augustus never issued a, a census. There's no historical record of that happening. 
Quirinius did issue a census when he became the governor of the region, but he didn't become the governor of the region until about the year 6 of the Common Era, 6 AD. So although it doesn't line up really historically accurately, Luke doesn't care about that. He wants us to know that this is not a trip that Mary and Joseph took willingly. They didn't choose this trip. They were far from home because they were forced to be far from home. And there they were in this strange place, not knowing anyone and discovering once they arrived there that there was no place for them to be, no place for them to sleep, much less have a baby. Had the labor pains started yet? Uh, How far apart were the contractions as they were frantically going through the streets of Bethlehem trying to find a spot? Eventually, they just had to stop. They found a manger, a place where animals would have eaten. Now, in our sanctified imaginations, we always place that manger inside a nice warm stable, but that's not what the Scripture says. They just found a manger, and who knows where that manger was? Was it in a back alley? Was it in a corner in some courtyard? Was it in a cave underneath the hillside, some spot that animals would have gathered to eat? They said, let's just stop here. I've got to stop. I can't go any farther. So here they are, just the two of them in a strange place, completely cut off from what is familiar, completely separate from any kind of Uh, of identity that they knew in Nazareth. I wonder what they talked about. I wonder what their conversation was in that moment. I wonder if they sang together songs of worship that they had sung in Nazareth. I wonder, as Mary lay there, if Joseph sang to her the words of Psalm 139, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me fast. I wonder if they remembered the words of Moses. Just before Moses died, he gathered the people together. I wonder if they recalled Deuteronomy 31, in which Moses tells the people, Be strong and be bold. Have no fear or dread, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. The Lord goes before you. He will be with you. Do not fear Or be dismayed. I wonder if as they sat there and remembered that story, they recalled that Joshua then picked up that idea. And after Moses had gone, he gathered the people together for a time of encouragement and told them, I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I wonder, as they crouched there in the darkness, so far away from home, I wonder if they remembered the words of the prophet that they had heard in synagogue. Isaiah 41, You, Israel, my servant Jacob, I have chosen you, the offspring of Abraham, my friend You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I wonder if there were anxious moments in the middle of the night when they had dozed off and they woke up with a start and looked around at their unfamiliar setting, 
and become a bit fearful, a bit afraid before they remembered, before they remembered where they were, and before they remembered that God was indeed with them. And because God was with them, they were home. Wherever you are, as my Nana used to say, remember wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, because God is with you, you are at home. One of my favorite musicals of all time explores this theme, a theme of, of being at home, of being connected, of being known by others and knowing them. In the story of Fiddler on the Roof, we learn about the life of a, a milkman whose name is Tevya. Tevya has daughters. Oy vey. And the daughters are giving Tevya grief, as daughters tend to do from time to time. The middle daughter is named Hodl, and Hodl comes to, to her papa to say that she has fallen in love with a man who's been arrested and shipped off far, far away to Siberia, and that she wants to go and marry him there. And that prompts Tevya to ask, and this man would ask you, to leave your father and mother and leave your home and go off to that frozen wasteland and marry him there? And Hoddle replies, No, he did not ask me to go. I want to go. I do not want him to be alone. And that prompts her to sing the song far from the home I love, a song that we're going to hear in just a few minutes, as a matter of fact, to explain to her papa that sometimes you have to leave home in order to be home. Life is complicated sometimes, isn't it? Life is complex and messy. And sometimes we have to leave the place of safety and security and home in order to be at the home where God wants us to be. Home. A place where you know who you are because God is with you. God's love and grace surround you wherever you go. Because God is with you, you are home. That's good news, isn't it? That's good, good news. You are home. Many people around us experience this time of year alone. Many people around us experience the holidays disconnected. Even if they're physically present, they're not really there. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally disconnected from family, friends. Many of us will be spending a holiday season without a loved one for the very first time. There is good news here, church. And having heard the good news, what can we do but share it with others? What can we do but let those around us know that you are welcome to come into my kitchen anytime and help yourself to a glass of orange juice? You don't even have to ask. What are we doing, church, but sharing the good news with those around us that wherever you are, God is with you. And because God is with you, you're home. So reach out to that neighbor that lives by themselves and let them know. Reach out to that coworker that just annoys the heck out of you and has distanced herself from 
the rest. Or that student in your class who's a bully because they have to keep the defenses up. Reach past those defenses and let them know they're not alone. Reach into someone's life that you haven't heard from from for a long, long time. A brother, a sister, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a dear friend. Give them a call just to touch base, just to connect. Reach out with the good news that wherever you are, God is there with you. And because God is with you, you're home. Let's pray. It is good to know, holy God, that you are present with us wherever we are. And because of that presence, we are at home. We are known. We are accepted. We are loved. It helps us remember who we are, God. And for that, we give you thanks. And now our prayer is that you would show us who it is in our lives that needs to hear that message. And you would equip us and empower us to share it with them. A message of love. A message of your abiding presence and peace. A message that lets them know that they are home. May we welcome others into our lives with the same joy and wonder that we welcome the Christ child born on this season. It is to you, our God, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.